R-Type is a Giger-style descent into a cold, alien world. A hopeless battle against an existential threat with insurmountable odds. Brutal difficulty that demands utmost perfection and garners respect for anyone skilled enough to complete it. The Dob Keratops that guards the first level is the most iconic image in shooter lore. The Stage 3 Mothership, one of the most copied and reused designs in the genre. Technology overtaken by grotesque, organic forms, and imagery that reflects the despair of being lost within a distant, alien sanctum. Ingenious gameplay that's so well designed, you'd never guess it was the first game to implement these mechanics way back in 1986. The Force Pod, now synonymous with R-Type, a brilliant weapon that requires you to play strategically while never fully protecting your ship, used as a shield to absorb bullets as well as launched to destroy hard-to-reach enemies while leaving you exposed. A careful balance between offense and defense that forces you to approach each area like a puzzle. In R-Type, you're capable of dying at any moment, only adding to the stressful atmosphere it creates. There's nothing haphazard about R-Type. It's the granddaddy of strategic shooters, where you experiment to gain progress and have multiple ways to survive. Every area has enemy patterns with a purpose, meant to be overcome, and survival in the later stages is key, as dying and losing your power-ups leaves little choice but to let the Bido Empire feast on your corpse as your vision slowly goes dark. It's a testament to great game design that despite its brutality, so many still come back to this series, knowing full well they won't likely get past the first few stages. It's designed so deliberate, the game's visuals so creative, and the music so engrossing that it remained fun to play over and over, while slowly improving and progressing further. One hit and it's back to a checkpoint, naked without your force pod, trying to survive long enough to reclaim it again. R-Type was genius in its design and brutal in its demands, and the fact that it still retains its place among most shmup top 25 lists to this day, despite being released so long ago during the 80s, is due to the brilliance of Irem's design. Join me on a journey through the Bido Empire, from arcades to early ports to remakes and modern consoles. And remember what makes R-Type one of the greatest shoot-em-up series of all time. It all started in arcades in 1987, hot on the heels of Konami's Gradius, releasing just two years prior. The STG market was heating up and Irem was already established, with popular classics like Moon Patrol and Kung Fu Master being smash hits in the arcade. R-Type was their first game to run on the new M72 arcade system and turned out to be a smash hit itself, both in Japan and abroad. It was quickly brought over to North American arcades the same year by Nintendo and after just nine weeks of testing, reported earnings comparable to hits like Double Dragon, Super Sprint, and OutRun. R-Type was a hit worldwide and it wasn't long before it started appearing on home console and computers. Just a year later, in 1988, the home port for the PC Engine came close to replicating the arcade experience. So large it wouldn't originally fit into a single system Hue card, the game had to be split into two parts before the later US release on the TurboGrafx-16 was able to fit them onto a single card. Still considered the most impressive and arcade-accurate console port of its generation, it looked and played great with chiptunes that even improved over the arcade original and is the version I still play most often myself. But it wasn't the only impressive port of R-Type in 1988. 
as it was also released for the Sega Master System and ported by none other than the legendary team at Compile. Known for Xanak and their Alesta series at the time, Compile was one of the most prolific and well-versed developers of shooting games of that era, but a little known fact is how many games they ported under contract for others. And much like an early M2 of their time, Compile went above and beyond in their efforts to do deserving games justice. While the SMS was a much less powerful system than the PC Engine, not capable of reproducing R-Type Arcade in all its glory, what Compile pulled off was a minor miracle. Not only is it still one of the most impressive games of the entire library, but it even has a system-exclusive hidden stage and boss that can't be found anywhere else. Anyone looking to show off the capabilities of the Master System during that time could use R-Type as a shining example of what was possible. In the case of R-Type, Sega definitely did what Nintendo didn't. In fact, R-Type was never released on Nintendo's Famicom console, despite the arcade cabinet being distributed and released in North America by Nintendo themselves. Maybe the hardware simply lacked the horsepower to do it justice, but whatever the reason, the Famicom was never graced with an R-Type release. That sure didn't stop everyone and their mother from releasing it, gracing over a dozen consoles and home computers like the Commodore 64, Amstrad, Atari ST, MSX, ZX Spectrum, PC-88, Amiga, Sharp 68000, and even later, the Game Boy Color. R-Type was everywhere, kicking the ass of poor unsuspecting kids and adults alike. And while it spawned several sequels through the generations, the original remains the most remembered and well-known shooting game both at home and in the arcades, right next to Gradius. Later in 1998, over a decade later, a near-perfect, uncompromised arcade port of both R-Type 1 and 2 was released on the first PlayStation, along with exclusives like a new intro and a gallery spanning the series' history. More importantly, this was no software emulation, but a reverse engineering of the original hardware and reprogrammed from scratch. If you're going to play an arcade perfect version of R-Type on a home console, the PS1 is a great way to do it. In fact, R-Type sold well for Irem and can be historically credited for them creating a brand new and excellent new R-Type game less than a year later with Delta, which we'll cover later in the video. And finally, a decade later in 2009, an incredibly cool tribute to this original classic was created for the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360, titled R-Type Dimensions. Completely recreated in, uh, three dimensions, it's not a reimagining, but overlaid onto the 2D version of the game, while retaining its stage timing and enemy placements. One of the coolest features is the ability to switch perspectives on the fly, going back and forth between 2D and 3D on a whim. It's really quite a love letter to the original and was also released on the PS4 and Nintendo Switch as Dimensions EX. Dimensions also featured two-player co-op, as well as an infinite credits mode for the legion of players that could never complete the game to have an opportunity to finally do so. And while the game isn't as arcade accurate as the reverse engineered R-Types on the PlayStation, being a bit more loose in terms of hit detection, and not the de facto choice for hardcore players, Dimensions was a real love letter to fans, decades later after release, and a great way for casual players and the 99% of us to enjoy the game. Often imitated, but never duplicated, the original R-Type will always be a seminal game in the history of STGs, and one of the best-selling, most popular, and well-known games 
of the genre. How does one follow up one of the most revered classics of the genre? In many ways, you don't. R-Type was such a seminal release that Irem chose not to rock the boat, but simply try and capitalize on what made the first so popular. Just a year later, when most of us were still barely coming to grips with the original, Irem already released R-Type 2 in arcades. And one could describe the game in a single word. Brutal. Irem doubled down on creating a game that was so punishing, only the most hardcore of players need apply. With the original already known for its unforgiving difficulty, Part 2 up the ante in almost every way. Though the game is shortened from 8 to only 6 stages, it was quite a feat for most players to even see half of it. Despite new ship upgrades like an improved charge shot and additional weapon types, R-Type 2 was enjoyed mainly by expert players. Despite the original's toughness, it had a certain something that egged you on to try again. The designs so inspiring, the music so eerily cool and catchy, and the puzzles just out of reach, feeling like with just a bit more practice you can overcome the next area. R-Type 2 simply laughed at your silly attempts, and the second half is an exercise for the most dedicated players. Possibly a result of being slightly rushed to market, while looking and sounding great, didn't quite eschew the same aesthetic creativity as the first. The color scheme is more brown and drab, reflecting a more mechanical nature, and the music not quite as inspired as the tunes of the original. And let's be honest, if you're the majority of players that won't see past the first stages of a game, enjoying the presentation of your short experience is key. But where R-Type 2 may not have been as exciting as the original in terms of aesthetics, it more than made up for with Irem's well-designed, thoughtful, and rewarding gameplay. Not only is the challenge as hard as ever, but the skill and creativity to overcome each area was some of their best work. Stage 3 took the mothership idea to the next level, taking on waves of cruisers trying to blow you out of the sky. Later stages were so puzzle-like, with shifting backgrounds and environments, that they've yet to be replicated by any other game in the series. For the experts, Finally learning to complete R-Type 2 in a credit was an exhilarating experience that few games can match, and love to this day for a rush few other games have provided. It's the original gameplay amped up in every way, and while it was eventually passed up by more casual players for simply being over the top and way too difficult, it remains a perennial favorite for pros that have the patience and skill to enjoy the gauntlet that Irem created. R-Type 2 did see home ports as well, though not nearly to the level of the original. Aside from the aforementioned arcade perfect PS1 port, it also saw release on the Amiga, Atari ST, and later on Game Boy. It also received an exclusive and highly controversial reimagining on the Super Nintendo in 1991. Reimagining as it wasn't arcade identical, but simply inspired by it, with some stages being very similar while others being redesigned for the hardware. But that wasn't the reason for its controversy. Dubbed Super R-Type, it became the poster child for slowdown plagued SNES ports, especially shooting games. Sometimes running so slow it felt like a standstill, it partially ruined what could have otherwise been an excellent game. The graphics are fantastic, and the music is arguably even nicer than the arcade original. The game has plenty of exclusive content as well, with unique stages and bosses. 
Unfortunately, it was also marred by a poor design choice to eliminate mid-stage checkpoints. That's right, now if you die, including on a boss, you get sent all the way back to the beginning of the level. No bueno. According to sources, Super R-Type failed miserably to meet sales expectations in the US, selling only 50,000 copies of an apparently overproduced whopping 300,000. It resulted in the complete dissolution of Irem's American division and a painful blow to the company. Despite being a household name, the game received enough bad press to spell its doom. But in 2021, there's good news for gamers as decades later, just recently this year, hacker extraordinaire Vitor Vieja came to the rescue. Responsible for multiple SA1 no slowdown releases like the famous Gradius 3 hack, he's now completed a hack for Super R-Type as a service to fans everywhere. Now Super R-Type can be enjoyed at full speed no slowdown glory by downloading his free ROM. And while the game is now even more difficult running at full speed, it's also a blast to play and something I recommend any fan of the series try at least once. As a community, we all owe Vitor a debt of gratitude. Give his hack a whirl. You'll either love it or be wishing you could have some of that slowdown back when it hands you your ass but you'll appreciate what the game could have been given more development time. Of course, Irem didn't go quietly into the night, and in 1993, Righted their wrong on Nintendo with an exclusive follow-up, R-Type 3 Third Lightning, developed specifically for the console and with much more experience on Nintendo's hardware behind their belt, Third Lightning was a fantastic game and considered one of the best of the series. Not only was all of the crippling slowdown removed, but it took advantage of the unique SNES hardware to its fullest with scaling and Mode 7 effects galore. There's no doubt that R-Type 3 is a great looking game with more interesting levels and designs much closer to the original and an opening music track that rocks out the original classic and sets the tone for the rest of the game. The trademark difficulty is intact as this is still one difficult game but proper checkpoints are reinstated and it never devolves into the experts only madness of part 2, at least not on the first loop. It feels just as surmountable as the first, which is to say hardly, but achievable with persistence and practice. R-Type 3 has some new tricks up its sleeve with two new types of force pods each with their own unique mechanics and uses, adding quite a bit to the longevity and playing the game with various ships. It also has a more interesting charge beam, which can now unleash a devastating barrage, particularly useful against bosses. But be warned as it has a cooldown, leaving you unable to use your charge again for a time. R-Type 3 was possibly the most creative of the series up to this point, not only bringing back some nostalgia in a boss rush of old favorites, but puzzle-like stages and a more organic look of the original. And while R-Type was always known for its phallic imagery with all forms of snakeheads, zygotes, and sperm-shaped creatures looking to penetrate you one way or another, I'm surprised what Irem got away with given this was on a Nintendo console. Normally, Sega was the one to push the limits on what was acceptable in home games at the time, but some of this imagery would make Sonic blush. In any case, R-Type 3 was a return to form for Irem in the home market and still known as one of the best shooters on the Super Nintendo, which is a shame as it was also the last new R-Type to be released for home consoles until five years later in 1998 for the PlayStation with Delta. But that's not to say there weren't any R-Type games in between, 
or at least a couple of very cool spin-offs that to this day have never received a home port and remain arcade exclusive. The first being Armed Police Unit Gallop in 1991. Immediately obvious is the game plays nothing like a traditional R-Type, being extremely fast-paced and lacking any type of force pod, but you'd be mistaken to blow it off as a not well-known offshoot not worth your time, as if you look at the graphics closely, you may notice a striking similarity to games like Last Resort on the Neo Geo and later In the Hunt. That's right, this game was made by none other than Nazca Corp that later went on to create the Metal Slug series. And aside from being about as fun as it looks, it also has a unique element where your position on the screen determines the scrolling speed of the game, moving faster the farther you are to the right. And completing the stages as quickly as possible is what the game is all about, as extra points are awarded at the end of each for the speed it's completed. Without a force pod, you're left with a standard, forward firing weapon, missile units, and lock-on lasers that deplete a meter when used. Also known as Cosmic Cock, it almost plays like a mix of a shooter and a racing game where you play the stage as quickly as possible and have a time to beat for maximum bonus. Some stages are clearly Gradius inspired, with diagonal tunnels to maneuver. The sprites in this game are large, as is your ship, but you can thankfully take some hits losing your weapon upgrades first before actual death. While it's not as deep as the core R-Type games, or as long given the quick nature of the levels, it's a well-made and fun shooter nonetheless, making it an obscure offshoot of the series. Three, two, one, let's go! Less obscure was another spin-off a year later in 1992, R-Type Leo, also the very last game in the series to release in arcades. And the first thing anyone will notice is how gorgeous the game looks. It's by far the most colorful of the series, with beautifully detailed backgrounds and sprite work. It's a sight to behold and arguably the most graphically impressive of the series except it's not actually our type. Leo was originally created as its own unique game, not meant to be, so there's no force pod to be found, and the gameplay is more traditional, with less puzzle-like elements the series was known for. Your satellites now fire either forward or backward, depending on the direction you're moving, and the charge shot launches them for a powerful attack before they quickly return to you. R-Type Leo, despite not being a true R-Type, is still a very cool and competent game. Aside from being a feast for the eyes, it has interesting music beats and a more forgiving progression. While not an easy game, it allowed for two-player co-op, as well as not responding to a checkpoint on the international version, so you respawn where you die. And while there was no Bido Empire to be found, Many of the stages still featured a lot of organic, alien forms, so at least it had a similar vibe to the R-Type series. Kind of like how Super Mario 2 in the US wasn't really Super Mario 2, yet it played and felt enough like a Mario game to where we all accepted it as such and didn't think twice. At least I did. R-Type Leo is another cool shooting game that has never seen a home release. Another shame, as it most definitely deserves one, whether a classic R-Type experience or not. Recommended simply for the sights and sounds alone, in addition to the faster paced and fun gameplay. Leo may not be a classic, but it was a worthy game nonetheless. It was a long five years following the release of R-Type 3. The popularity of shooters waned, replaced not only by fighting games in arcades, but more powerful home systems and new genres with extended gaming experiences. And as Irem completely ceased making video games in 1994, the prospect of ever seeing another R-Type became slim while former employees moved on to form Nazca Corp 
and continue making excellent games. New Irem releases seem to be at an end. However, in 1997, Nanao, the majority shareholder of Irem Corp, established Irem Software Engineering, which shortly after took over development of all future games going forward. And in 1998, less than a year later, development of the next official and first ever fully 3D polygonal R-type game began, Delta. And it turned out to be what is often considered the best in the series next to the original. R-Type Delta has everything one looks for in an R-Type game. Creative, moody, and foreboding stages, deviously difficult levels filled with puzzle-like elements, and vicious bosses that will easily set you back to a checkpoint time and again until you learn the best approach. But it has that formula of making you want to come back for more, overcome the challenges, and see what lies around the next corner. There are now three ships to choose from, each with their own mechanics and weapon systems, though they all have a new Delta attack. As your force pod kills enemies and absorbs bullets, the gauge builds to release a bomb, killing or damaging all enemies. The music in Delta is trippy and full of mood, perfectly matching the atmosphere of every stage. If it wasn't for one complaint held against it by some, it may have even overtaken the original as the greatest yet. Hardware limitations. That's right, Delta was an early PlayStation game, and polygonal graphics were in their infancy. It did everything right in terms of gameplay, music, and the most detailed stages of the franchise. But there's no other way to put this. It's not the prettiest game around. The polygonal models can be rough, and the textures low resolution. Much of the great design and artistry gets a bit lost in the jagged edges and low resolution textures. And that's a shame because Delta is truly brilliant, a game worth gushing over. So what is one to do? Well, it is over two decades later. We can rebuild it. We have the technology. We can make it better, stronger, faster. We can play R-Type Delta in 1080p, 8x anti-alias with enhanced textures, and make Delta look like we wish it did in 1998. So if you were wondering how it looked so good at the start before I showed it in the original form, now you know. And if there's one game that could use the official HD remake treatment, Delta is it. The level design is really the best the series has ever seen. So good in fact that it's hard to play and not gush about how cool the stages are. Instead of another mothership, stage 3 is Empire Strikes Back, with a giant walker taking its place as it cracks the ice beneath you with every step. Stage 4 is a vertical ascent through a ruined space station, with fast enemies coming at you from all angles, later within a maze of boxes and debris as you maneuver through them. Stage 5 is one of the coolest levels of any shooting game ever produced, having you float through some biological mass with a maw and the insides of an alien beast in the background. As pulsating containers of giant brains float by, you have to dodge around rotating debris and devious waves of enemies that'll have you pulling your hair out until you figure out the right maneuvers. Later, remnants of deceased bosses from previous games, like the Gomander, floating through the mass as if they've been swallowed in time, float haplessly by, now overtaken by worms. The mothership from the original game, now in sections, endlessly spinning and attacking you as the various weapons rotate past your ship. The art design is as grotesque as ever, 
easily the creepiest of the series. As you return to your base to find it overtaken by the Bido, you're greeted by a pulsating mass of meaty flesh cocooned within a previously human ship that you can actually use for cover from the onslaught around you before taking it out from behind. And after working your way through and descending down the shaft, you're greeted by an old friend looking meaner than ever, venom dripping from its mandibles. But the final stage is the real coup de gras as you float through what seems a limbo of time and what the Baito Empire has used to travel and destroy civilizations. Alien babies trapped in crystals, images of space shuttles, astronomical and historical structures phasing in and out of the background, DNA strands and mathematical equations floating by to represent the timelessness of this dimension as a giant egg filled with alien sperm assaults you from various angles. Presumably a time limbo from where the Baito Empire has been gestating and launching its attacks. Talk about subtext and symbolism in a schmuck. The idea of the Baito despising humanity for creating and then abandoning them in time that they're no uglier than humanity and the worst aspects of our nature, watching and plotting revenge against human civilizations from time while yearning to become like us and take our place. The entire level, including the music, plays like a trippy, atmospheric stage in G. Darius with ominous voices echoing as you progress farther into the lair. Instead of being an incredibly difficult stage, it's actually pretty easy and more a reward from the designers for making it this far, to sit back and enjoy what they created. This stage gives me chills when I play it, and is one of the coolest, creepiest, and most perfect of R-Type moments in the series. It encapsulates the cold, inescapable emptiness of time, and a world that you're not meant to see or ever return from. Aside from the early graphics, Delta is a grand piece of game design and one any fan of the series should play. It's considered by quite a few as their favorite shooting game on the original PlayStation. It has the devious, puzzle-like stages the series is known for and creativity to spare. Play it on a CRT or using an emulator with some nice upscaling to give it an extra polish for modern monitors. But any fan of R-Type should not miss a chance to play Delta, one of the best games in the series. Another five years passed before the world saw another R-Type game, and only then, due to the persistence of producer Kazuma Kujo, wanting to make one final R-Type game that according to him could be played for a very long time as it was in fact intended to be final. Its claim to fame was the huge amount of content to explore and unlock, a first for any R-Type, with over 100 ships, many customizable, and stages with branching paths that would also unlock more ships and upgrades when certain conditions were met. It was an incredibly ambitious undertaking, and one reason many still remember the game fondly. And in terms of unlockable content, Final achieved its goal. Unfortunately, the game and stages themselves couldn't match the ambition of the content locked behind them. Being a later generation release, 
the polygonal graphics are cleaner and improved, so the game is nicer on the eyes, but not as detailed as Delta. More a mixed bag of some very cool areas and bosses, along with others that are generic and less inspired. The music is more atmospheric, sometimes replacing actual music with sounds to create a mood. And the stages are longer and more spread out, but without as much happening for stretches at a time, so the game moves at a slower pace. Several areas of Final were quite creative and well done. This tormented incarnation of a Doc Keratops is gruesome and changes up the formula with an under-liquid encounter, a battle with its internal organs once the head has been defeated. Battling the mothership, it now flies over a human city before descending to building level as you take out its thrusters. The stage where you're warping through space is some interesting eye candy before a boss that I thought was the most fun of the entire game, figuring out the patterns on its lasers. But for every cool area, well executed puzzle and creative boss, you have an equal amount of dead space with gaps in enemies and not much interesting going on. So it's a mix of mediocre moments interspersed with very cool ones. The difficulty can also be uneven, with large portions of the game being easier than Delta or traditional R-types, but other areas with unexpected difficulty spikes out of the blue. This final stretch of the penultimate stage before the boss is so incredibly difficult to near unpassable with a starter ship that it's several times harder than anything in the game becoming a twitch shooter based on reflexes instead of the careful planning and memorization our type is known for. And I imagine anyone but the most experienced players will have gone back and tried to return later with a far more upgraded ship to make it at least somewhat manageable. Speaking of this final stretch, if you manage to make it through the gauntlet, you're treated to our Gomander friend, only looking more phallic and suspect than ever, with shiny worm heads, along with the alien orifice you squeeze into for the final portion of the battle. We'll leave the rest to your imagination. Final is not a bad game, and has moments of brilliance, but was buried under the weight of expectation and previously classic games in the series. However, what it did do well is longevity and customization, to such an absurd level in fact that it's difficult not to appreciate it for that alone. The amount of ships is astounding, and if Final is a game one truly does enjoy, playing through it using various ships and options could truly last one a hundred years. which is what it's felt like since we ever played or saw a new R-Type game. There was R-Type Dimensions in 2009, a reimagining of the original two games, and even a couple real-time strategy offshoots called R-Type Tactics, which expanded on the lore of the series and Bidal quite a bit for those wanting to learn more about the story. But it's been almost two decades since Final in 2003 that we've seen a brand new R-Type shooting game. In 2019, much to the surprise and elation of the shmup community, R-Type Final 2 was announced, headed up by Kazuma Kujo, original designer for In The Hunt, Metal Slug, R-Type Delta, and Final, and developed by Grand Zella Group, made up of former Irem and Nazca Corp staff. There's a renewed hope to see Final 2 bring the series back to glory. In June of 2019, the Kickstarter campaign launched and to date has smashed its initial goal, reaching almost a million dollars in funding, unlocking quite a large amount of additional content now added to the game, like recreated stages from R-Type 3, Delta, and Final, a unified cross-region and platform leaderboard, subtitles in many other languages, and more. 
scheduled for release in just a month at the end of April, it's not long before we're able to finally play the game. So fingers crossed, it's as good as we hope, and I'm back with a review that I enjoyed making. Our type was so influential on the genre that new games to this day still borrow from its design. The Force Pod has been reimagined in genre favorites like Polestar and Last Resort. The puzzle-like, thoughtful gameplay had such influence on our ideas of what a shooting game can be that developers today still endeavor to emulate what made it so involving. And the brutality of the original R-Type and Gradius remind us of their arcade roots, where eating your quarters was a top priority. STGs were fun to play, for novices and experts alike, but designed as games of skill. They weren't meant to be easily played through once and then forgotten, but practiced to the point of mastery. The purpose is in the journey, the fun you have along the way, and mastering the skills you need to become an expert and you don't have to be the greatest player of all time to enjoy it, but simply feel the exhilaration of improvement in your own game. Most people that played R-Type never finished it, but many enjoyed their time and kept coming back for more. There's a misunderstanding of the STG genre in popular culture today, where they're seen as short games with little longevity and either too difficult or meant to be credit-fed to completion, undermining their original design. And yet, it's these games that many of us return to decades later to continue and enjoy, while many others remain a fond memory, but no longer as entertaining to replay again. We have so many tools today to improve that we didn't back then, from save states, to rewinds, to stage selection, and more. Everyone is welcome to enjoy the games as they see fit. But the true joy of what makes a game like R-Type special, and why fans of the genre are so passionate, is the exhilaration we get from achieving seemingly impossible goals. Clearing a game without continues, or reaching a new high score after hours of practice. It's the rush of personal achievement after grueling hours of determination mixed into a game that you love to play. And no genre does it better and harder than shoot 'em ups Often imitated, but never duplicated, R-Type stands alongside Gradius as the most influential horizontal shooter in the genre. Over three decades removed from its first release, it's still the series many of us happily return to. Now if you'll excuse me, I've got a date with Bido, as it seems human civilization needs saving again, and the almighty Dop Keratops is waiting.